In today's episode, we open our Bibles to 2 Peter chapter 3. What will happen when Jesus comes back? How should we live in light of his promise? These are some of the questions that Peter answers in the third and final chapter of his second letter. He warns us about the scoffers who will mock the hope of Christ's return, and he reminds us of God's power and patience in fulfilling his word. The apostle also describes the dramatic events that will take place on the day of the Lord when the heavens and the earth will be dissolved by fire and replaced by a new creation where righteousness dwells. Good morning and blessed Pentecost. Today is Friday, September 15th, and you're listening to Thy Strong Word, where each weekday morning we explore the holy scriptures through which God bespeaks us righteous and nourishes our faith. I'm your host, Pastor Phil Boo of St. John Lutheran Church in Laverne, Minnesota. And as always, Thy Strong Word is brought to you in part by the Lutheran Heritage Foundation. You can learn more about their translating and publishing work on their website at lhfmissions.org. My guest this morning is regular contributor to the show, the Reverend David Boisclare. He's the pastor of Faith and Bethesda Lutheran Churches in Pine Lawn, Missouri. Good morning, Pastor, and welcome back to the program. Good morning, Pastor Boo. It's always a joy and pl- privilege to be with you here on the air. Oh, well, it's always a good day when I get to talk to Pastor Boys Claire, and you are going to be wrapping up Second Peter for us. Uh, first and Second Peter are one of those, or are, are among those, uh, epistles in the Bible that are just so crucially important, and I think they kind of get overshadowed by all of Paul's letters. Um, I don't know. What do you think? Do you think that's true, or maybe it's just oh, me? I think you're right. I think you're totally right. And um, uh, as, as, as they're they're kind of more limited, you might say, but they're they're really gold mines uh, of precious uh, teaching from our Lord, and and uh, that's that's why it's it's really exciting to be able to study them. Yeah, some of the key things and even famous verses that people know uh, come from these epistles, and I don't think always people know where they come from. But I tell you what, we have a lot to get started on, so would you begin our time together in prayer, please? Gladly. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, you have effected a perfect salvation for all to be received by saving faith. Grant that we may lay hold of that salvation conveyed to us in gospel and sacrament, continuing steadfast to the last days of our life in this sinful world. Guide us by your Holy Spirit to study our text for today, Second Peter chapter 3, that we may be among those who joyfully look up when the end of the world comes as those confident that their redemption draws near in your name. Amen. Amen. Well, I, as I like to do, maybe we should set the stage, catch up on what we've been talking about so that, well, our chapter today makes a little bit more sense in case people haven't tuned in. So maybe just really quickly, I don't expect you to go through both uh, epistles, but just where have we been so we know where we're going to go, brother? I think uh, uh, in chapter two uh, yesterday, that uh, was an excellent program in which uh, was discussed uh, the um, heretics uh those that those that trouble the church uh and and uh you know interesting interesting creatures and it it, it was rather interesting how the apostle peter uh, really has their number he knows and he understands them and what's interesting is comforting right at the beginning of that chapter is that uh, it is spoken that they deny the lord that bought them which is an important thing to remember that god uh that Christ's redemption uh, has rescued everyone, or that that uh, it is not a limited atonement, as a John Calvin would say, but that even those that are lost have been blood-bought souls by the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, of course, there there is the uh, the warning that the apostle gives here that uh, these are, are blemishes at their love feasts, uh, and they're they're probably uh, gnostics, which. Uh, um, are, are basically say it doesn't matter what happens to our bodies uh, because uh, what's important is uh, the spirit and not the material of life. So it's the same kind of errorists and heretics that the Apostle Paul had to deal with in, as, as he does in uh, his uh, pastoral epistles. 
Yeah, and I think that is something that continues to be very pervasive in our world today, this sort of Gnostic uh, spirit good, body bad, earth bad, heaven good. Uh, And what we're going to see coming up is that, well, the body is good, although, of course, in this world it is uh, plagued by sin, and the world is good. It's God's creation. Uh, But, of course, there's going to be a new creation. Both of our bodies and our souls are going to be resurrected in the end. As I like to say, heaven's great, but it's not the end of the world, right? There's more to life than even heaven. We have the new heavens and the new earth. That's going to come up today. Um, I tell you what, why don't we go ahead and just dive into the last chapter. I'm going to read, oh, the first seven verses. Here we go. This is now the second letter that I am writing to you, beloved. In both of them, I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles. Knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own desires. They will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. For they deliberately overlooked this fact, that the heavens existed long ago, and that the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God, and that by means of these the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. But by the same word, the heavens and the earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and the destruction of the ungodly. All right, it's the end of verse 7. A couple of things just that just jump off the page to me, and that is, um, maybe Peter was wrong. Nobody scoffs about the coming of the Lord nowadays, do they, brother? I say sarcastically. <laughs> Oh, yeah. I mean, I remember reading about this obscure cargo cult in uh, in like the um, South mm-hmm. Seas in, in the Pacific. I don't know if you ever heard of them. But have, after yeah. World War World War II, uh, there were uh, GIs that were there and they promised to come back from America and bring all kinds of, um, you know, relief and, and uh, food and, and, and other and other and, and then made that into a cult. It was called the cargo cult of the coming of John from America. And uh, when when these uh, natives on these islands were were interviewed by uh, reporters, they, uh, you know, the reporters said, well, it, it, it's now been about 30 or 40 years. Uh, they haven't come. Uh, well, he, they, the, the response was, well, you Christians have waited for your savior to come uh, in, during the past 2000 years and he hasn't come but so we'll, we'll still wait from our for our John from America so so there are scoffers all around yes absolutely i mean there are people who i guess mock it right and god of course is not mocked there are people who mock us and i think in the context of peter he's also referring to people who actually believe in god but still mock the idea that christ is coming back Yes, and and in this particular case, it, it it's uh, they use the it, they're talking about the second coming of the Lord because they use the word parousia, which uh, you know is kind of like that that His presence uh, that and, and and it's it's very very definite that there is a uh, unity of belief among the apostles about the second coming of Christ, and of course uh, you know you you might have the idea of those who criticize the Bible that uh, say well uh, originally when Christ was was um, uh, walking the earth in his er earthly ministry that that he promised to come uh, within the same generation or something, and then that didn't happen. And so then the church had to cope with that. And and so this is kind of like the uh, apostles embarrassedly, uh, you know, just kind of coping with the fact that has, he hasn't come yet, but but I think if you read Scripture and you understand it, you know that that uh, they should understand that there is a time, uh, you know, there is a period of time between his ascension and his coming again, and that, and then this this uh, chapter, of course, deals with that type of deal. When we read Paul, we get the sense that he genuinely expected Jesus to kind of come back before he left this world, and. I imagine that when those types of things didn't happen, a lot of people were discouraged. But at the same time, we learn that from John, who was eagerly anticipating the coming or the return of the Lord every day, 
that's how we should be. You know, at the end of the Bible, right? We say, come Lord Jesus. It should be our ultimate wish that, you know, the show, this show doesn't even end uh, before Christ comes back. While at the same time, we live knowing that we don't have the time. We don't know when he's going to return. So while we eagerly wait for him, we still live as though, you know, this is all there is, that, that we are just working our way uh, toward helping our neighbor until the Lord does come back, whenever that is. And then I think it's that tension that really bothers people because it's tough. We have to both plan ahead while at the same time eagerly hope that our plans won't ever need to be put into action. Oh, yes, and and you know you've heard that uh, apocryphal story that if Luther was told that uh, uh, the Lord would be coming again the next day, that he would plant a tree today. Uh, so you know, I mean, it's 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 basically the idea that um, God's intention is that we don't know when that is, so that we can always be properly prepared, and that we should carry on in the manner that the Lord uh, wants us to do in in our vocations. You know, not be like uh, the, the the Thessalonians, of course, who just simply stopped working and, and sold their property and then just, uh, or, or, you know, I mean, there were certain cults in the 19th century that uh, would do that, and then they'd go out and, and wait for the Lord to come, and then they'd have specific dates that were mentioned as well. And then, of course, uh, when it didn't happen, <laughs> then they have to go back right. to their regular lives. One of the things that I find also interesting is when he puts words in the mouths or perhaps is just quoting them of those who are mocking and is, you know, either the false teachers of his age or the ones to come. He says in verse four, they will say, where's this promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. That kind of sparks in my mind. The uh, Jews saying, we've never been enslaved to anyone, <laughs> completely ignoring all of their history or our history, because their history is our history. But in this case, it's, it seems like the same thing. It's like things are just going as they've always been. There's been no real big changes and nothing's ever going to change. Is that what the false teachers were saying? Oh, of course. And, and, and what's rather interesting is that uh, maybe even uh, the, the secular science and, 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 I'm, and I'll tell you something, I've been I'm very disappointed in science. When I was a, a, y- a young person, I, I used to think science was the panacea, the, the helper for any any problems in society. But now, you know, now you have science that is basically, um, you know, developing a religion and and and, and just simply um, uh, sold to the highest bidder. But, you know, I mean, now they say, well, the, the, the sun isn't going to blow up for another billion years or something like that. So we don't have to worry about that. So, there, you know, in a sense, you have from all sides, you know, those who are uh, uh, that oppose the truth, the true faith. Uh, are, are scoffing at us, much in the same way as Elijah uh, scoffed at the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. You know, I mean, it, it's rather interesting. They, they point out uh, that, uh, you know, in the, the book of Second Peter is, is very well written in Greek, but there are uh, there are Hebraisms, so, which shows that the person that that was the author of this was a Hebrew, uh, was someone who spoke Aramaic and, and Hebrew. And uh, and like in that case, it's just kind of like a, a, the way of, you know, where is where is the promise of this coming? And and, uh, and and there's so many things that we can point to to say that it's not going to come. It's not going to happen. You, you, you are all believing in vain. Jumping on your comments about science, though, I just I can't help but say I had the same experience, you know, as a kid. And even today, I love science. I love true science. I love um, maybe not capital S science or or uh, registered trademark science, but certainly that which seeks to understand God's word. I've always been fascinated by that and also one of my favorite subjects in school. But we've come a long way from the medieval universities where theology was the queen of science or the queen of study because everything back then they understood that everything we learned was about um, understanding God's world. God was understood. So you had theology as the queen of science. You had Sophia or wisdom as her twin sister, and it was a pursuit of understanding God's universe. But as you said today, it's been very, very unfortunate the way it's been sold and politicized and everything else. 
And now, even in universities, what do you look at? Philosophy departments and theology departments, they're kind of like the, the backwater departments of the university, barely hanging on when they used to be sort of the highest of all pursuit of knowledge. Well, Ian, and, you know, it's rather interesting that science has to, uh, or, or the science department has to compensate for that. Uh, I mean, if, if uh, we're not going to have any dogmatism or any, any um, um, you know, philosophical thinking, then, then obviously science has to do that for us. And, and, and the, the purpose of science today is, is simply, you know, science is supposed to be uh, um, it's supposed to be indifferent. It's supposed to be objective in its views. In other words, nothing is true unless you can prove it to be true. And and, and nowadays, it, they, they kind of, it's almost like a religion. And, and so science creates a universe in which uh, things happen uh, without God. So, so what, what must we think about how the universe was formed or how everything came into be without God? The presence of God. So that that's basically, uh, you know, what science does. Um, you know, that so I, like I say, they 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 don't have enough, uh, you know, putting in the, the philosophical thinking. Then science has to do it for them. That's right. And, and verse five says, "For they deliberately overlooked this fact that the heavens existed long ago. The earth was formed out of water through water by the word of God." Um, I, one of the Bibles that I have with the notes in it, it's the uh, Evangelical Heritage Version. Uh, it says this about that verse. It says, those who claim scientific proof that the world is millions of years old intentionally forget the divine power required for things to come into existence out of nothing and the evidence of the changes that were brought about in the world by the fall into sin and by a universal flood. So I, I don't know if that's universally true. But this, these words deliberately overlook suggest that the people who are spreading the false knowledge, both back then and even today, really have to kind of actively ignore evidence of God, actively ignore the weaknesses in their divineless or godless models. Um, is that would you agree with that statement? Oh, oh, absolutely, absolutely. And you know, it's interesting about that verse. It talks about uh, you think about. Is it saying that the world was created by water? Um, and it's what what you have here is an explanation of what happened in Genesis chapter one, where it says, "Well, God um, created an expanse, and then he and then, or that He caused the waters to come together." So when when it talks about that, they they um, were formed out of. In other words, uh, the dry ground came out of the water when the water was all. Uh, put into its proper place, and then there, of course, at that time it says that there was water above the firmament or the or or the uh, expanse or heaven, and then there was water underneath the earth. So that you know, as as some scholars say, it's it's it was formed, it came out of the water, and then it it was between the water. Uh, that that's what that verse means. But but again, it's like basically uh, the Apostle Peter is, is basically taking them back to Genesis 1. Right, exactly. I mean, we have the waters above the firmament. We have the great deep, the springs, the fountains, et cetera, et cetera. We have these um, biblical understandings. Now, of course, those biblical descriptions are condescensions, right? It's It's God coming down to us in ways that we can understand. Uh, the Bible is not a science textbook, so to speak, but where it speaks on scientific matters, it is true, of course, because it's God's word. So when we look at this sort of figurative speech, we have to be careful to both not take it so literally in the sense that we, we find fault in its descriptions, because remember, it's speaking to a people who didn't really understand a lot of these things, while at the same time, we don't want to doubt it because it doesn't match the way we talk about things today. Instead, we trust God's word. And we know that, um, that of course, God is the, the creator. What's interesting, though, is we have the earth being formed out of water and through water by the word, and then the deluge of water. So he points to the flood, which, of course, you ask folks like Ken Ham and, and most Christians, to be honest, and, and they're going to really uh, put a lot of emphasis on the changes that would happen with a worldwide deluge. And, and frankly, although I think folks like Ken Ham sometimes – you know, that's their only hammer, and so everything looks like a nail, so I have to be careful about that. But at the same time, I do think it makes a lot of sense to look at it 
from that perspective. But because that's associated with faith, it's discounted immediately by those who are seeking to understand the world, uh, scientifically, that is. Exactly. And even in our own uh, our own history uh, in our Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, we had Alfred Raywinkle, which wrote a, a book on the flood. Uh, so they, they were influenced by that. You know, I mean, it was it w- when the flood happened, it was it was a, a cataclysmic event. Um, and, and is believed, I, I don't know how true this is scientifically, but they said that it used to be that uh, the axis of the world was not tilted, be, you know, after creation and that it was uh, that was uh, straightly uh, perpend or, you know, in other words, parallel or not parallel, but perpendicular to like uh, the the plane of the ecliptic or whatever, so that the, that the, uh, that the climate was the same everywhere on earth. I don't know whether that's true, but then if it was tilted, uh, the flood caused it to be tilted about 23, what in a quarter or half uh, degrees, uh, then, then that was a creation of seasons in, in the year. But, you know, again, it's, it's, um, it, it, it's mere speculation. You know, we have to kind of rely on the clear teachings of, of God's word. Well, absolutely. So another another verse, though, we have water, 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 and then we say in verse 7, or he says, but by the same word, that word that created the heavens and the earth, the word of God, the heavens and the earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. I uh, remember a pastor preaching. He wasn't a Lutheran pastor. I think I saw him on TV. And he was uh, he'd passed out stickers to all the people in his parish, and the stickers said, um, to be burned on them. And and so part of his sermon was go home and stick these stickers on all of your most treasured possessions to remind yourself that they are all being stored up for fire. Now, whether or not that was effective or not, I got to say, yeah, it's not entirely unclever. I kind of like it because there is this reminder that while at the same time we have a stewardship obligation to take care of the world, we also know that ultimately God is coming back and what we have now will not be as important as the new heavens and the new earth that we will have. But that when they do come back, and we'll talk about this in a minute, I'm sure, it's a real world, not just floating around spiritually, but a real world. But we see here, they are stored up for fire. Now, is that how you read it, the stored up for fire? How would we, how would we best teach that to people? Well, it, it, it's obviously referring to uh, what is going to happen on the last day or, uh, you know, a, and after that, the end of the world, um, because Scripture teaches us that the uh, former things will pass away, that the form of this world is passing away. Uh, and there were differing uh, views of that. Uh, Luther, of course, believed that the entire world was not going to be destroyed and that, um, you know, like a total annihilation of the world and uh and and some like Gerhard Johann Gerhard said well on the basis of second peter chapter 3 it's go- it is going to be totally uh burned away but you know it's rather interesting as you look at these passages you can see that 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 both uh, uh, views could possibly be be held. It, it reminds us that these things are not permanent, even as the Apostle Paul says, the things that are seen are temporal, but are temporary, but the things that are not seen are eternal. And that even ourselves, I mean, with our death, we will, we will have the sinful part of us destroyed through death. And, and that's somewhat similar to fire. Absolutely. I mean, and, and the focus here, of course, isn't the specifics, maybe, but the the day of judgment and the destruction of the ungodly. That can be seen a couple different ways, in my opinion. Uh, the day of judgment, of course, is Christ's return, judging the living and the dead. But the destruction of the ungodly, that either motivate. well, I think it both motivates us to reach out to the ungodly so that they need not experience that destruction but at the same time, for those Christians, especially the ones to whom Peter was writing, if they're struggling under persecutions and abuse, um, there's part of them that probably wants to take vengeance, but vengeance is the Lord's, right? He's going to vindicate. So there's also that aspect of God will make things right in the end. You know, there will be justice. You, of course, escape justice because of your faith in Christ, but they uh, they will not. So I think it's kind of a double-edged sword there. 
Oh, absolutely. And the Apostle Paul reminds us that we will be, uh, you know, cleansed with fire. I mean, divine fire. Um, you know, it, it's rather interesting in, in my pre- preparation. I, I saw, uh, you, know, you know, some of the ancient philosophers says, well, you can't destroy fire with fire. So in, in the world is made of earth, air, fire, and and uh, let's see, earth, air, fire, and water, uh, that you can't destroy uh, fire with fire. Well, there is divine fire, which able, is able to destroy all things that God intends to destroy. And God right. wants to destroy everything that is uh, impure and, and contrary to his will. Now, does this destruction mean annihilation? And, um, you know, why not? <laughs> Well, obviously, we know that uh, that those uh, like the as we've seen in the in chapter two that they're the angels which sinned are are in placed into uh, chains of darkness, uh, Tartarus. Uh, that uh, also those who um, follow after them and their will is against God will also uh, be subject to being destroyed forever in eternal fire. Yeah, and I think that's key for because a lot of people believe that they're is no hell and that even there are christians who so-called christians i would say that believe that there is no hell uh but second thessalonians and i think that's what you were quoting he says they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the lord and from the glory of his might etc so this destruction isn't a they're annihilated cease to exist and and no longer have any sort of consciousness it's sort of a eternal constant destruction that is really caused by the absence of God's love uh, and the absence of his grace because he removes those things from those who reject him eternally. Exactly. And but the comfort we can take comfort that the Lord on judgment day uh says that uh, the the going away to to eternal fire of course is of the prepared for the devil and his fall and his fallen angels it, it people do not belong there but the the marvelous fact is that our lord jesus christ who went everywhere a human being could go descended even to hell to declare his victory so he was everywhere a human being could possibly be we do not have a high priest who's unable to sympathize with our weaknesses well folks we're coming up on a break but the next verse that we'll cover when we return is one of the most misinterpreted and misunderstood verses, and I can't wait to hear what my guest has to say about it. Basically, it says, with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as a day. This has impact on the way we try to rationalize science and our faith and what the scriptures teach. But we'll talk more about that when we return. So folks, don't go anywhere. Pastor Boys Claire and I will be back. We'll see you on the other side. These are the voices of young Lutherans in Mexico City, children who are excited to learn more about their Savior, Jesus. But they need our help, because good Lutheran books for kids in the Spanish language are in short supply in Mexico. To learn how you can help tell Spanish-speaking kids everywhere about Jesus in a language they can understand, go to the Lutheran Heritage Foundation website at lhfmissions.org forward slash Juan 316. Welcome back to Thy Strong Word. I'm your host, Pastor Phil Boo. With me today is the Reverend David Boisclair, pastor of Faith and Bethesda Lutheran Churches in Pine Lawn, Missouri. Dear Saints, thanks for taking the time to be in God's Word with us this morning. I really mean it. The show would be nothing if it weren't for your faithful listening. But I also pray that you're growing in your faith toward God and your love toward others. If you want to reach out to me, you can find me on Facebook, but you can also email me at pastorboo at gmail.com. You can use that email for a little while longer. I'm going to be getting an email especially for the show, so stay tuned in the future to hear that one. But for now, you can just drop me a note to say hi, or like I said, find me on uh, Facebook. So Pastor Boys Claire, 
Let's read this next text, uh, 8 through 10. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord, one day is a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are on it will be exposed. Now, it, the thought continues, but just pausing there to talk about that thousand years thing, um, I have heard, and I know you have too, People use this as a way to reconcile the millions of years that science wants to claim the age of the earth is with, of course, the biblical text. So they say, well, if a day is like a thousand years, a day could be like a million years. And perhaps the perhaps the examaron, which is the six days of creation, perhaps that took place over millions of years. Now, there are lots of easily easy ways to disprove that from the scripture, but that's what a lot of people believe. So, uh Take us through that. What, what does that really mean? What's the real context of that? Well, um, the, uh, what, what it's saying is that God's relationship to time is different from ours. Uh, that, um, uh, you know, I, I kind of like to think of God as timeless. He's outside of time and space. You know, uh, he, he's outside of the space-time continuum. Uh, he is eternal. Uh, he, he exists in, in, in the eternal now and, um, and, and the idea here is that, um, you know, maybe, maybe from our perspective or human's perspective, because it takes, uh, for, for a thousand years, it takes maybe uh, uh, a little, little less than a thousand generations to go through a thousand years, but uh, that uh, obviously, you know, he has his own timetable. Uh, it, it, it is a false thing to use this verse to try to uh, think of the day, the hexameron as, as being not six or seven days, uh, because uh, that's how God created and established the week. In six days, the Lord created the heavens and the earth. He could have done it in six seconds, or he could have done it in, in a million years or whatever. But uh, the, the Word of God specifically says, and there was evening and there was morning, morning, one day, two days, three days, and so on, that that was God's intention and that they were uh, excuse, uh, an excuse to some of my brothers that, that it was 24 hours, uh, seven days of 24 hours. Um, and, uh, and that's something that is explicitly said in Genesis. Now, here you have uh, the, a, day, a, a thousand years or as one day or one day is as a thousand. It doesn't say one day is a thousand years. And a, a, a one or a thousand years is one day. It says they are like a thousand years or like a day. And so, in, in other words, it's it's that God's understanding or his his experience of time is different from ours. Yeah, the Old Testament scriptures say that God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Well, I guess hills one thousand and one and beyond, uh, he doesn't own, right? No, that's a, it's a figurative number to speak about how God is uh, ruling over all things. And same here, right? God is outside of time. And the context here is about patience, not about trying to calculate and reconcile our worldly opinions with the scriptures. It's about, you know, the Lord isn't slow to fulfill his promise. He Slow is not something that exists with God because he's outside time. Time is a part of creation. But that slowness as we experience it, we should see it as also patience, right? Because God is not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. As we as Christians, and I have more than once in my life said, Lord, I just, I just, could you come back right now? I, I'm ready. I am ready, Lord, to see you. Um, and then, of course, that doesn't happen. And and it's like, well, you know, let me look to the scriptures and see, see why God is so delayed. And that's what we're being told here. He's like, listen, he's patient toward you, but he's also patient toward all those around you, all those false prophets, all those, the ungodly who are going to face destruction. God loves them so much that there's patience there. But we shouldn't mistake his patience for uh, inact inaction or inactivity because, as verse 10 says, the day of the Lord will come. There will be one day when his patience runs out. 
In, in verse 10, you have probably one of the most beautiful expressions of God's universal grace. He is not willing that any should perish. You know, that, that kind of goes in with um, Matthew 18, because I think that's uh, that's in there. Like, uh, what do you think? If you had 100 sheep and one goes astray, uh, will you not leave the 99 and go and search for the, the, you know, God is not willing that any should perish. So there is no uh, election or predestination for damnation. Um, and, and, you know, or, you know also St. Paul says in First Timothy, you know, God would have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. And, and so, and, and so damnation is never something that that God uh, brings about in terms of, in other words, that he is the cause of it. Uh, you know, they, uh, yesterday, uh, in, in your program yesterday, you were talking about predestination. Uh, predestination um, is never to damnation. And, and we can say this, that predestination is the cause of salvation, but it is it has absolutely nothing to do with anybody being damned. That that predestination is is totally ruled out. And that um you know it, as far as damnation it is totally the fault of those who are damned. I think a lot of people confuse like the motives of God as with, you know, our own human sensibilities. God, if he wanted to, because he's ruler of all things, creator of all things, he could just wipe us out. He could. I mean, like we have the flood, but even beyond that, with just the speak, the speaking of his word, everything could be erased. His love is for us so great that we see that he has planned out our salvation through Christ. And it makes sense. So you're right. It throws a wrench in anyone who wants to say, well, God has already decided who's going to heaven and who's going to hell before the foundation of the world. If that were the true, then what is the motivation to forgive people their sins or to even send us his scriptures so that we could come to him and learn about his will? It, it wouldn't make any sense at all. But as we know, as you say, the Lord does not desire. Um, he wants all things, all people to come to his truth and holiness. Um, let's keep on going. Verse 11. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved— what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn? But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. So I can tell you, growing up, uh, heaven and hell were always in view in sermons, Almost never, and I'm going to say that with a little asterisk because, you know, I was a kid, so maybe I just missed it. But I don't ever remember a lot of talk about the resurrection. Um, now, I, was, I didn't grow up Lutheran. I think that should also be reminded for people. So as a Lutheran, though, that the idea of the resurrection was something that was fairly new to me even as an adult. You know, we confess it in the creed. Of course, the scriptures speak of it. But most people today, I think most Christians and even Lutheran Christians, when they talk casually about dying, they talk about dying and going to heaven. And there's there's sort of a – we're missing the whole, well, there's more to that. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about the resurrection. What's that going to be like, brother? I mean are we going to be floating around in heaven with with harps? <laughs> what What should we understand? disembodied spirits uh well uh, you know i i think that's that's something that that has to be kind of remedied not that we uh discount what our lord said to the thief on the cross today you shall be with me in christ or in, in paradise or uh, what uh saint paul said i have a desire to be absent from the body and present with the lord in second corinthians 5 uh but uh, the the hope is for the resurrection of the flesh that's why we confess that in the creed uh, you know, I believe in the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. And 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 even in uh, 2 Corinthians 5, you know, the Apostle Paul says we don't want to be unclothed. Uh, so it, it, it's kind of like a natural, should be natural for us to want to have the body. And then if you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the Apostle says, how come you um, Corinthian Christians are speaking about that there's no resurrection of the dead? You know, if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not raised. And if Christ is not raised, you're still in your sins and you're people most to be pitied, uh, but uh, but certainly the hope 
is for the resurrection of our bodies. And, and one thing I wanted to point out about what, what he's talking about here in, in verse 10, I think there's a mistranslation. It says, and the earth and the works that are do, done on it will be exposed. In the original Greek, there is actually a word that is uh, that, uh, the word not. Uh, the word is to be found, or it, so it actually should be the works will not be found. Uh, and so, in, in other words, that this great fire of, of judgment uh, that, that brings to an end the form of this world now will, will totally uh, purify the world of all evil and of, and of all, uh, so that they will not be found. And that, that's kind of something which shows that, uh, the, that it's not going to be a total annihilation of creation, but that creation will be purified. You know, even as the Apostle Paul says in 1 uh, Corinthians 15, where he says, we shall not all sleep die or but we shall all be changed but again uh, it should be emphasis we we maintain and we we solidly confess the resurrection of our bodies they will be fashioned like unto his glorious body by the power with which he is able to subdue all things unto himself now I wasn't aware of that uh, variant um, or misinterpretation I was just looking at Furisco uh, sort of discover, be found, but I didn't know that that was um, – hmm, that's an interesting uh, new take on it. Of course, the overarching message remains the same, and that is that there is a time when the Lord is coming back to judge the world and restore it. Now, I think that's also been up to for debate. Is it going to be a restoration of what we have? Is it going to be completely destroyed and redone? I kind of think the Bible talks about it in both ways, sort of. Uh, mostly, though, I think the Bible really leans toward – this is going to be destroyed. If that's the case, I think a lot of well-meaning Christians might ask, well, then what about our stewardship of the world? I mean, what, what's the point if, of, of, of making sure that we don't pollute our air and water? What's the point of, of building things up if they're just going to be burned, if I'm just going to put a sticker on everything that says to be, be, to be burned? So why is it that we should both take care of this world, this gift, this creation of God, but also understand that God's going to come back and just redo everything anyway. Well, all of creation, of course, being God's, is is put into our care as as stewards. And and the Lord reminds us that He who is faithful in a little will also be faithful in much. And so, obviously, um, you know, it, basically everything is for us. Even as the Apostle Peter, or, I'm sorry, Paul says, you know, all things are yours. I mean, uh, God has created the uh, the universe and everything for His people, for the church, and and they are they are placed in uh, as stewards of of His creation. And uh, you know, He He will do what He will do. He He. Uh, with with that, but he he is doing it for our benefit, uh, and 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 he reminds us that that he who is faithful in just a little will also be faithful in much, and so you know in eternity uh, we will of course be entrusted with far greater things. Yeah, that definitely meshes with verse eleven because he says, "Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, that is, since Christ is coming back, he doesn't seem very concerned about telling us exactly what that's going to look like. He's more about saying, since the Lord's coming back, then you know what kind of people ought you to be, right?" And he says, "Live lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming day of God." Now, waiting for makes sense. Living in lives of holiness and godliness makes sense. The hastening causes me to pause because is there something we can do to hasten God's coming? Well, obviously, like at the end of the Bible, where, where the, he says, our Lord Jesus says, behold, I am coming quickly. And then the church responds, e yes, even so, come, Lord Jesus, Maranatha. Uh, you know, in this case, it's for us. Uh, we're actually, obviously for our sake that, that uh, you know, if we're uh, occupied with doing the work of the Lord and, and um, following in his ways, that it'll hasten that coming for us. Um, and, and, but most of certain God, of course, knows when he's going to bring it about. That's his best kept secret. Now, I remember when I first became a pastor and I had, um, I really was kind of, how can I say it? Really inspired by some of the things I learned in seminary, particularly about the resurrection. You can thank uh, Jeff Gibbs for that. But, uh, we have verse 13, but according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth. And I preached a lot, really emphasizing that. And had a couple of very faithful parishioners come to me and and say, 
Well, you know, I don't know that we really heard that a lot. Now, I don't necessarily think that's true. That's not any comment on my predecessor. Uh, in fact, I told him, if you don't believe everything they say about me, I won't believe everything they say about you. <laughs> but, <laughs> but the point is, um, I think a lot of people don't think about that, even if the pastor is preaching it. Uh, but yet this is found in Isaiah. And of course, it's picked up here and it's also in Revelation. So this new heavens and this new earth, I don't know that we know exactly what it's going to look like, but how does that mesh with the symbolic imagery of heaven that we see in Revelation? I mean, what are we to expect or what don't we know or what do we know about this? Well, there will be no more division between the abode of God and the abode of his blessed saints in eternity. That uh, as as in Revelation, it says there will be no more um, uh, sea, there, there will be no more sun and, and so on, uh, because the, the, the Lamb and, and, and God and the Father uh, will, will be its light. Uh, so, so, I mean, it, from what I can see, it, it, it seems to me that the fire, of course, is purging and cleansing creation uh, so that it will be kainos is the Greek word, which is, uh, distinguishes it from that which is uh, pileos or old. Uh, that, uh, you know, it's rather interesting that the word neos, which is also the Greek word for new, is not used here. Uh, now, neos would be like something that is that is simply created or come into existence. But this is something which God purifies, and then uh, it is... Uh, you know, no, no longer is there any uh, anything that is old or corrupt or evil in the, in that creation. But God will exist with us, um, and you know this will be His peaceable kingdom, in, in which um, you know we will be present with Him forever. Yeah, that word "kainos" there for new, meaning you know something previously unheard of. You know, new in that sense. It's the same word that's used when they were express, you know, uh, expressing their surprise at Jesus's teaching in Mark. They say well, some kind of new teaching with authority. It's the same word. So this this unexpected, this newness. I think there's part of it that we really won't or even can't understand right now but will be, of course, much like the earth in terms of its physicality. Uh, but at the same time, it's also going to be Eden restored. At least that's how I've always seen it. Is is Eden restored a, a good way to look at that? Oh, absolutely. And, and, and it, when the Lord says, behold, I make all things new, this is in line with the gospel. The gospel is a, a, a message. It is, it, it is something that eye has not seen nor ear heard, nor has it entered into the hearts of men, the things that the Lord has prepared for those that love him. And that's, that's the understanding of what the good news is, is that it's always something that is preciously new and new forever, uh, like a, a pure spring of, of uh, for fresh water for for God's people, and and that uh, we will it'll it'll be such a such a marvelous experience, and and that's part of that that's the thing uh, where where the apostle is saying you know do you want to be uh, among those who endure or are you going to be those that are going to be um, removed from the earth and obviously uh, sent away in eternal punishment. Mm. Well, why don't we read the very final words of Peter to his audience, uh, starting with verse 14 through verse 18. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. And count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction, as they do with the other scriptures. You, therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Um, I, I love how he uh, throws in a plug for Paul, speaks of him as a beloved brother, and rightly so, speaks of his letters in these matters being uh, wonderfully uh, edifying. But then he says, but there are some things that are hard to understand in Paul's letters, but he points out something that we still run into today, 
and that is the ignorant and unstable twisting the scriptures to their own destruction. You know, for as many people out there that just completely deny Christ and deny God and deny his word, there are many of those who claim to be Christians and perhaps even are Christians, and yet they read the scriptures in such a way that it just twists them, and it is to their own destruction. And I, I think that's why it's so important that all Christians be faithful in the word, uh, but also be a part of a faith community that reads them responsibly. Oh, that's so that's so vitally important. It's rather interesting that you mention uh, talk about the the twisting of the scriptures. Uh, you know, the, the uh, commentators say it's like it's like how you would torture someone uh, that that the scriptures are being tortured. Uh, you know, and it kind of reminds me too that uh, even um, uh, Will Durant, who wrote a history of Western civilization, said that if the ancient works of Plato and um, Aristotle and and all of the other other, other writings of ancient times were subjected to the twisting and the and and the um, contradicting and the um, you know the way the holy scriptures have been uh, subjected to and although they went through all that they still are here aren't they uh, that all of those other things uh, like Plato and, and Aristotle would all go into the into the mists of of, uh, of legend and, and and not be true <laughs> and so uh, obviously those that twist the scriptures and and uh, you know they they'll find out that uh, the Lord who is who is more powerful than any force that we can possibly imagine can definitely cause his word to uh, endure <laughs> oh absolutely the word here by the way for twist um, is streblo which is only found here in all of scripture and it means to distort something uh, communicate something in falsely or to change the meaning of but it being combined to the, with the phrase to their own destruction, as they do the other scriptures, uh, that's also really telling. You know, when people read the scriptures, they are certainly there for our edification, and God certainly brings us faith. But this is one of the reasons why I'm personally, and, and hopefully, uh, I, don't, I don't know what your position is, but I don't think evangelism is done by going out and passing out Bibles to everybody, or frankly, even little Gospels of John or whatever, because I think more of the idea of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. You know, you can sit there and you can read it. And if you are self-aware enough to say, I need help with this interpretation, then that's fine. But so many people will read it and they, I don't. it's not for unbelievers because the scriptures could only be properly understood by faith. So that's why it's important for us to be out there building relationships with people so that through our faith, we can expound the scriptures to them, whether you're a pastor or a lay person or anybody else. Well, I think that's vitally important. You're exactly right. Uh, you know, because that's that's the manner in which Christ grows His church through through the hearing of faith uh, that, and, and from those who can, uh, you know, somebody who who you recognize as has your best interests at heart that wants to share God's great and powerful and amazing love in our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and, and, and that, that of course, is, is what the Holy Spirit uses. Uh, you know, obviously it is true that people can gain uh, knowledge of salvation and, and uh, saving faith from reading Scripture, but of course. it means so much right, to have the evangelists. Yeah, I just wanted to jump on there and just agree with you wholeheartedly, because sometimes when I say that, people do misunderstand me. And you're right. I'm not saying that an unbeliever or God can't use the written word to bring someone to faith. In fact, I'm sure he does it all the time, but it's probably not the most most ideal way because he wants us to have relationships with people. Well, we're here at the end of the program, brother. Uh, anything else? We have like one minute. Yes. Uh, I want to note that it says that uh, St. Paul's writings are scriptures. So there you have sort of a, a kind of a decision on canonicity here uh, in this passage. Uh, but most especially, Martin Luther loved the last verse here of this uh, epistle, where he says, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And Luther said, learn that he is the pinnacle. He's the highest point of, of, of our uh, salvation, knowledge, and righteousness. And he said, if I could leave behind me only one lesson, it would be the lesson that I have stressed and taught with all my might, namely that people ought to cling to Christ in the plainest and simplest fashion. 
then I would regard myself as a happy man and think that I had accomplished much. Mm, what a beautiful sentiment. That's where we're going to leave it. I'd like to thank my guest this morning, the Reverend David Boyce Clare. He's the pastor of Faith and Bethesda Lutheran Churches in Pine Lawn, Missouri. Pastor, thanks for being on the program again. It's been such a blessing. God bless you, Pastor Boo. Thank you. Folks, Monday, we head into the Old Testament, and we begin a whole new series on the book of Joshua. So I pray that you'll join us for that. But until then, may God's peace and blessings be with you all as we pray. Father, keep us in thy strong word.